At the beginning of 1965, a mushroom grew in this godforsaken corner of the Soviet Union. Neither the lifelessness of the steppe nor the severe frosts, even by local standards, prevented it from growing because the mushroom was not an ordinary mushroom but an atomic one. Later on, one of the leaders of the Test 1004 asserted in his memoirs that he had never seen a more beautiful sight, and there was something romantic in this feeling indeed. The force of the nuclear reaction lifted 10 million tons of frozen soil into the air, but it was not a simple experiment with yet another device that would introduce the Americans and their allies to the mysterious cousin's mother. It was the birth of the peaceful atom in its new incarnation, not only bringing light and warmth into homes, but literally rolling mountains. Peaceful nuclear explosions in the USSR were carried out from 1965 to 1988 under the secret program Superscript 17. A total of 124 peaceful nuclear explosions in the interests of the national economy, including 117 outside the nuclear testing grounds, were conducted in the USSR. Of these three, Globus 1 in Ivanova Oblast, Kraton 3, and Kristal in Yakutia, were accompanied by accidents involving leakage of radioactive decay products. On January 15, 1965, the first industrial nuclear explosion in the history of the USSR was detonated at the confluence of the Chagan and Ashisu rivers, 100 kilometers southwest of Semipalatinsk, Kazakhstan. There were 123 more ahead, in the Yakut tundra and the Siberian taiga, the Turkmen desert, and the densely populated Donbass. In this video I will explain how the Soviet economy attempted to use atomic charges for peaceful purposes and what came of it. Operation Plow The genre of peaceful nuclear explosions or, in the officious Soviet interpretation, nuclear explosions for the national economy, is deservedly in the shadow of the military use of atomic weapons. Even the very combination of the adjective peaceful and the phrase nuclear explosion now looks like an oxymoron. After decades of propaganda on television, in movies, and in the press, drawing the dire consequences that the emergence of a characteristic mushroom-shaped cloud several kilometers high causes, it is hard to imagine that half a century ago the energy of the nuclear fission chain reaction was seriously considered as a means of rapid and cheap implementation of many infrastructure projects. This possibility was first mentioned by a representative of the Soviet Union at an international event at the United Nations. On November 23, 1949, just three months after the successful test of the first Soviet atomic bomb, he declared from a high rostrum, the Soviet Union has not used atomic energy to accumulate arsenals of atomic bombs. It is using atomic energy for the tasks of its own economy, to tear down mountains, to change the course of rivers, to irrigate deserts, to build new roads in places where no man has yet set foot. This, of course, was hypocrisy. The Soviet Union was at the time frantically trying to catch up with the United States in the size of its nuclear arsenal and was not concerned about economic issues. But the idea voiced at the UN really soon captured the minds of scientists. This was the beginning of a romantic era. After the end of World War II, it seemed that there would, now for sure, be an era of peace and successes in the conquest of the atom and then in space exploration sparked various large-scale projects. And there will be apple blossoms on Mars, sang a Soviet song from the early 1960s. They really believed in it, and not only in the Soviet Union. In 1957, the Plowshare program was launched in the United States, a reference to the biblical saying, let us shear swords into plowshares, with plowshares being plowshares. One of its main inspirers was Edward Teller, America's foremost nuclear physicist. Among the ideas theorized to varying degrees were grandiose projects to build the new Panama Canal, to construct a huge artificial harbor in Alaska, and to destroy part of the Bristol mountain range in the Mojave Desert to build highways and railroads through it. All of this was to be accomplished through a series of several dozen nuclear explosions, Test of the first experimental device GNOME was held December 10, 1961, 
and July 6, next year, at the Nevada test site, was carried out Operation Storax Sedan. With its help specialists tried to determine the effectiveness of peaceful nuclear explosions to extract large amounts of earth and rocks, which were later planned for use in the construction of large infrastructure facilities. The result was impressive, the 104 kiloton thermonuclear device ejected more than 11 million tons of soil, and the resulting crater, 100 meters deep and 390 meters in diameter, is still the largest artificial object of its kind in the United States. Program number 7. Naturally, the Soviet Union could not remain indifferent to American experiments. That same year, 1962, when the colossal sedan artificial crater appeared in the Nevada desert, the Moscow offices finally gave the go-ahead for the start of their industrial nuclear explosions program. It was numbered seven, the previous ones were occupied by various military nuclear projects. About two and a half years were spent to prepare the first experimental device, to determine possible tasks and objectives of its application in the interests of the national economy. At the end of 1964 the staff of the top-secret KB-11, the future All-Union Scientific Research Institute of Experimental Physics in Arzimus 16, where among other things Khrushchev's Tsar Bomba was created, completed theoretical training and went to the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site in the Balapan track to do it. Three-meter-long device with a diameter of 860 millimeters was lowered into the well at a depth of 178 meters and flooded just in case. At noon on January 15, 1965, someone pressed a button and more than 10 million tons of Kazakh land went into the air journey. The Soviet Chagan was more powerful than the American sedan, 170 kilotons, about 10 babes that destroyed Hiroshima, and the result was more impressive. The resulting crater was as deep as in Nevada, 100 meters, but a little wider, 430 meters against 390. However, the most important difference was that this crater was also intended for practical purposes, unlike the purely experimental sedan. The lake formed as a result of the Chagan project. The ejection blasts were the simplest of all peaceful blasts, but allowed to solve, at least so it was assumed, specific problems. For example, there were big water problems in Central Asia. In Semipalatinsk and neighboring regions of the Kazakh SSR, with it all was fine only during the snowmelt, and then came the dry season, complicating the cultivation of delicious and healthy foods. The nuclear explosion allowed to create instantly a sufficiently large funnel with a small evaporation area, into which several million cubic meters of water from the nearest river could be collected in spring and used quietly during the coming summer and autumn. In the spring of 1965, the Chagan River Channel was connected to the still fresh crater and it quickly filled up. Adam Cole, a man-made atomic lake, appeared on the map of Kazakhstan. The event that had been awaited for so long happened. It was the usual heat of the area. People were languishing. True, it was a little cooler on the shore, but how the placid water surface beckoned. Truly, it was a bit close, but no bite. Goodbye. At last the medical personnel gave the go-ahead, and all the inhabitants of the settlement ran to the beach. We had a long swim, from the bottom of our hearts. Wrote an enthusiastic journalist in 1966. The Izvestia newspaper wrote enthusiastically in 1966. A local legend says that the first one to take a swim in the lake was Yefim Slavsky, the permanent head of the Soviet nuclear industry and three times hero of socialist labor. He eventually lived 93 years vigorously. But that optimism quickly faded. The radiation background was falling slowly. The animals that lived in the lake or drank from Adam Cole sometimes mutated or even died for some reason. Nothing came out with the creation of a network of water reservoirs and the Soviet deserts and steppes continued to be thirsty, but in other sectors of the economy peaceful nuclear explosions were nevertheless used quite extensively. Successes and Failures 
already in March of the same 1965 burst in Bashkiria, directly at the operating Grachevsky oil field. In those years, Soviet oil workers were upset by low efficiency of extraction of valuable hydrocarbons from under the ground. Scientists came to the aid of practitioners and suggested a new way to remedy the situation. It turned out that a small nuclear explosion provided a better opening of oil deposits, increased their mobility and correspondingly increased the yield of raw materials to the surface. Three Bashkir explosions of small power, 2.3 to 8 kilotons, codenamed Butan, gave an increase in the yield of oil one and a half to two times at 20 wells out of 40 available at the field. Subsequently, this practice was extended to six more fields. A total of 21 peaceful nuclear explosions were carried out before the end of the 1980s in order to intensify oil and gas production. The next, and the most popular, direction of the Program 7 was camouflage explosions, i.e. without release of harmful products to the surface to create underground storages of minerals. The fact is that the rapidly growing Soviet raw materials economy in the 1960s required a huge number of reservoirs for storing these very raw materials directly at the mines. Traditional ways of their creation looked unreasonably expensive and long in realization. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Write in the comments about what else interesting you can tell about this video. See you in the new video.